Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Janet Robertson from Consolidated Fisheries. I think uh, I met a lot of you in Norway last year, so it's a great pleasure to be here to be discussing this, which, um, as it turns out, looking back in old files, we've been talking about since at least, well, the whole of this century, in actual fact, and we don't seem to be any further ahead now than we were then. So this is a great opportunity, hopefully, to try and move forward on this issue. Um, well, Consolidated Fisheries, we're based in the Falkland Islands. Uh, the map you see in front of you, it shows the uh, inner conservation zone, that's the inner circle and the outer conservation. Uh, the green area is where we're permitted to fish, so it's in all areas up to a depth of um, to a depth of 600 meters, so we can't uh, fish anywhere below 600 meters. And the pink box in the bottom right-hand corner is a closed area for spawning between the 1st of June and the um, uh, thir 31st of August each year. Uh, the fishery was established in 1994. It was uh, initially an exploratory fish for fishery, and it, there was no quota set, but it was limited to a two-vessel fishery. Uh, consolidated fisheries was set up at that point. Um, and we, we used, we had two vessels, and then in 2006, uh, the Falkland Island government introduced an individual transferable quota system. Uh, we, CFL, got the license for 25 years, so, which will expire in 2031. We were one of the first to enter into this system. And uh, then in 2014, we got MSC certification for the fishery, which was a great step forward for us, and we still are the only certified fishery in the Falklands. Um, in terms of quota, uh, before, as I said, we were a limited to a two-vessel fishery. Then in 2006, when ITQ came in, uh, it was set at 1,500 metric tons. Then in 2008, it was reduced to 1,200 metric tons. At that point, um, we went to a one-vessel fishery. We've got the CFL Gambler. And then in 2015, the quota was reduced to 1,040 metric tons. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Um, as Eduardo showed you earlier on, we're using very much the same system as the Chileans. It's, uh, we call it the umbrella system or the cachalotera system. Uh, I'm sure Eduardo is going to talk about more in technical detail about the system later on, so I won't go into it now, but essentially you see you've got the mother line um, with a number of what we call umbrellas hanging off it. Essentially it's a cluster of hooks. We have clusters of seven hooks. I think Global Pesca have clusters of ten hooks. Uh, and essentially there is a net, a bell-shaped net, and what happens is that the line is uh, positively buoyant just above the seabed, the hooks with the bait are exposed, uh, the fish take the hooks. As the line is being hauled, the, uh, the umbrella falls over the fish and protects them, supposedly, from, from the whales. That's the principle. And we've been using that system since July 2007. The question is, is it effective? Well, the fact is, and in fact, um, realizing this over the last couple of days as preparing for this workshop, in actual fact, no trials were really done to establish, in terms of whale depredation on its own, how effective this system was. Numerous trials were done uh, by the fisheries department to try and determine changes in CPUE and how the different fishing system operated from a, a catching point of view, but the sole issue of whale depredation and how effective it was was not really um, calculated. However, uh, there have been benefits. Under, with the umbrella system, bird mortality, well, it's been zero for us since uh, 2007. The only bird was killed was on the Tory line two years ago, um, and average CPUE is up. Uh, that was one of the things that the trials did establish in, in 2007, which had all sorts of effects on, on stock assessments. And more than anything, there we go, the captains are happy. Uh, they're the ones that, that trialed the system. They decided that it is effective, and uh, we've gone with that. 
So there is, at the moment, no reason for us to consider changing that system. Uh, depredation history. Well, uh, as I said, reports of adverse whale interaction um, began to seem like a constant issue as from about December 2001. That's when we really began to notice it. Uh, at that time, we had two vessels in the fishery, the Pioneer and the Valiant. The Pioneer was a converted trawler and had a very loud engine. That's about as technical as I can get about it. Uh, and we actually removed her out of the fishery altogether in July 2002. Um, it was, she was a dinner bell uh, and couldn't outrun the whales and they were always waiting for her whenever she came into port and went back out again. Uh, so we actually we withdrew her altogether. Uh, we have more of an issue of sperm whales uh, than we do with killer whales. Killer whales are mainly located in the northeast of the zone, whereas, and they're more sporadic. They, they appear two or three times a year. Sperm whales are all over the zone and a lot more consistent. Uh, we did fund an investigation into say, cetacean interactions in 2003, a chap called James Moyer Clark. It was a report I'd completely forgotten about until I found it the other day and was looking through it. At that time, he did test an acoustic deterrent advice, which was completely unsuccessful. Uh, one of the conclusions he came to, which was um, sort of suspected at the time, was that the areas of highest catch rates or highest CPUE is where there was the concentration of, of highest, um, uh, highest presence of whales, which sort of led to the whole chicken and egg argument. Are the whales there because the, fish, because the boats are fishing and therefore they're attracted by the boats and the fish? Or is it that whales and boats are both attracted to areas of high concentration of fish? Um, there was quite some skepticism in our fisheries department as to whether it was actually whales that were taking, depredating on the, uh, on the lines or whether it was sharks or, or other species. Uh, James Moyer Clark also concluded that CPUE, while well, CPUE was not a great method for assessing whale interaction and being able to judge the levels of depredation, actually no other method is better. Uh, of course, there are a number of variables it's very hard to have a, a separate control system uh, to determine uh, the effects of whale depredation. Using the observer data that the fisheries department had been collecting since 2002, he concluded that over the course of 2002-2003, which is the period um, of data that he had available to him, he estimated there was about a 2% uh, loss um, to depredation. But on the field trip that he conducted on the Valiant at that time, he then concluded that there was actually, it was as high as 23% for that particular trip. Rather bizarrely, he then concluded that actually it, catch rates weren't really affected by whale depredation. And I'm not quite sure how he, he reached that on the, on the basis of 23%, but anyway. Uh, with regard to records, a little bit like Eduardo was saying, we collect a lot of records, but we, are not, we don't really have any standard methodology of what we're doing with this in information and with this data. So again, we're hoping that one of the things that will come out of this workshop is some idea or some indication about the best way to use the data that we're, that we're collecting. Um, for a start, daily interactions with, with whales, whale sightings, if you like, are recorded by the vessel and included on the daily catch reports. We do estimate green weight lost, and that is taken out of our tack. So uh, whatever the whales take does reduce what is available for us. Uh, we also, we don't just record um, whale, whale loss, catch loss to whales, but also to scavengers. I'll show you the records in a minute. Uh, also, separately, when the observers are on board, they take their own sightings and records, and that is the data that the fisheries department has been using recently to, to, to come to a number of conclusions. Uh, and we are measuring depredation rates in, in the number of kilos lost. This is just an example of a daily catch report. This is a summary, a summary of, uh, of 
daily, it's everything added together, which a vessel sends through every day. This, this particular one is for the 26th of December. Uh, just to show you how we estimate the, the lost catch, uh, essentially on the line where there is appearance of, of lost, um, of fish being de depredated, uh, the total product line, the pro total product weight is taken. It's multiplied by our conversion factor of 1.6 to get the total green weight of that line. That total weight is then divided by the number of fish on the line, which gives us an average weight for the fish on the line. That average weight is then multiplied by the number of fish that have been predated on to give us an estimated uh, green weight of the fish lost and that is added on uh, to the weight. So if you look at that little box where it says Papa Gambler, well Papa is just the, the code for, for, for toothfish, Patagonian toothfish. The HGT for this day on the 26th of December was 3.4 tons. Multiply that by 1.6 you get 5.5 uh, tons of green weight. Um, and added to that then was the number of the kilos of the fish predated on. So we ended up, if you look in the table on the left, Papa ended up being 5.7 tons gross. What we actually turned into product was 5.5 tons. So that's how we at the moment are calculating and estimating loss to whales. Uh, this is actually just a bit repetitive, but it goes to show this is the day those the report I showed you earlier is then uh, put onto this sheet. This sheet, uh, the catch reports between the 26th of December and the 31st of December. And as you see right at the bottom, we just record the whales that were sighted. So um, I, the little box in the top right-hand corner doesn't quite represent the other one. It's just uh, I didn't have um, a close-up of, uh, of the main one that I used. But it gives an example. For example, on one day we saw four whales, is sperm whales, and one GSK Greenland shark, which is not a Greenland shark. It's a somniosis sleeper shark. There you go. Uh, on another day, we had 14 killer whales and uh, one Greenland shark, and on another day, we had one whale, 10 killer whales, and one Greenland shark. So again, a lot of data. This data goes back. We've been collecting this since about 2010, I think. Okay. Logbook, as I said, we're, we are measuring the discards. Discards general is normal waste, heads, etc. Discard of the scavengers, that's toothfish depredated by the scavengers, and discards of whales. And on this particular day, which is the 26th of December, you'll see right at the bottom, the last two lines, you see on that particular line, we had four, uh, four animals that had been depredated on by whales uh, to a weight of 28 kilos, whereas we'd had 22 depredated by scavengers to a weight of 154 kilos. So again, a lot of data. Uh, this is just a quick extrapolation from 2015 data. The red line shows the total discards for the year. Uh, the, the blue column is killer whales. You can see what I mean about it being more sporadic during the year. Sperm whales recorded every month. Low during the winter months and uh, higher during the summer months. Uh, and there is a sort of pattern there with the general level of discards to, uh, with the whale sightings. The one extraordinary bit there is in July and August, and I suspect that if we looked more closely at the data there, we'd probably find that there's actually a lot of depredation by scavengers in that period rather than whales. Uh, Overall, this suggests a depredation level of about 3.1%. So given the numbers that I've heard from other fisheries, this probably is quite minor uh, compared to others. Ooh. Right, the uncertainties. Um, we are doing the daily records of, of discards, but we don't always have a, an observer on board, so this is not necessarily verified by observers. 
However, we're pretty confident that the, the crew are getting it right. I mean, it's fairly consistent uh, what they send through. The system of estimating green catch uh, weight lost is, depends on there being remains left on the hook to be able to tell that there has actually been something that's been predated on. Um, in our experience, at least the captain assures us that very often the killer whales take the lot, so you've actually got no way of knowing um, how much was taken by them. And again, as said earlier, we've got lots of data, but we don't yet have the methodology um, put in place to actually make the best use of that, of that data. And finally, again, one of the purposes, hopefully, this workshop um, is that we need to develop a robust methodology for assessing depredation rates. And um, hopefully that will come out of this. So that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>